Okay, uh, as Diane said, I am Theron, but my name or my identity don't, don't matter right now. What matters is uh, Joey Chavez, uh, um, who couldn't be here because uh, his grandfather is in the hospital. And uh, that says something about the, the uh, family that he comes from and the importance of family to him or just relationships. Um, uh, Joey was a sophomore. Uh, at uh, Saul Ross, and uh, uh, he took a upper division literature, uh, nature writing uh, course in uh, 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 literature and the, the natural world. And um, I brought all my students here last year, and it was, uh, I felt triumphant afterwards. And uh, Barry Lopez uh, shook my hand, and he shook uh, um, Joey's hand. And uh, I think that had a galvanizing effect on, on Joey. So uh, Joey became a McNair scholar in the summer, and he did an analysis of, the, of, of Barry Lo Lopez's sense of the craft of writing. And uh, then he wrote a story set in Alpine, Texas, that emulated Barry Lopez's style. And uh, Joey uh, um, summarized his the first part of his uh, McNair paper uh, in a bullet list of features of Lopez's uh, storytelling. And uh, so I'm just going to uh, uh, list off the features here. Um, um, for one thing, there is uh, the um, first person point of view with questioning and insight, love and vulnerability, unity, isolation and temptation, the known and the unknown, humanity and nature, friendship and bondage, the divine, and finally, reconciliation. Um, so I'm going to read the conclusion because we don't have time to read the whole story. And I'll try to capture Joey's voice, but I'm, I'm not sure. Joey has a lot of sincerity. Uh, w within a month after Elizabeth arrived, Mom passed away. After the funeral, we had a reception at our house to honor her. A few people we knew showed up, but for the most part, it was just family. My aunt on my dad's side, who was still very close to all of us, was present. It had been about 10 years since she had last visited our hometown. This place is getting crowded, she explained, as everyone was sitting down eating. I don't remember all of these big trucks rushing through here the last time I was here. You haven't heard, Mom's friend, Bill asked. Heard what? Well, about a year ago, some rich old fool sold a bunch of his land to the oil company. They're building a pipeline right through town. Beginning of next year, that pipe will be sending gasoline halfway to Mexico. That can't be possible. She seemed more concerned about the pipeline than my mom. This angered even me even more. I felt like we as a community lost a part of our humanity. All of these people in town that thought there was a chance clearly didn't understand that there was never going to be a solution. All of their hope, time, and effort put into stopping this pipeline, and yet its emergence was inevitable. For some reason, I could not stop thinking about what Elizabeth told me, and my mom wrote in that letter, you can do whatever you want, did that mean that what these people wanted was to sell their land to make a couple of million bucks? Not keeping in mind how this one choice will affect the lives of others? Is money all people really want in life? I was so lost in my head that when I came to my senses, I found myself in an empty house. When everyone finally left, Elizabeth asked me to come outside so that she could smoke a cigarette. My mind was so distorted, I didn't mind having one myself. As we sat in the, si in the silent, cool, dry night, we reminisced on all the places Mom had taken us when we were kids. 
By this time, Elizabeth had already gone inside and pulled out the exact photo album of the summer we, had con we were conversing about. I guess it had been a while since I went through these photos because I couldn't help but notice how beautiful everything was and Elizabeth's ability to take pictures. One picture in, particularly, in particular really caught my attention. It was of a few yellow wildflowers, the sun rising, white clouds, and an open blue sky. The this picture reminded me of all the times mom and I went to the local gardening store. She loved to plant, to, uh, to grow and create new life, as she often put it. Mom had over 20 different flowers and plants in her garden. Every time she planted something new, she would say, today we are giving back to the earth. Someday the earth would give us something in return. We shouldn't do this in order to receive something in return. The earth give us, gives us air to breathe every day, a beautiful sun to keep us warm, and lovely creatures to keep us humane. For some reason, I didn't want to put this picture back. I wanted to keep it forever, to remember what mom lived for. Um, I'm a little worried about time, and mainly I just want to capture Joey's voice as a writer. So uh, is, um, is Diane here? Or? Uh, so you'll tell me, because um, I don't want to Okay. You know, it really is a pity about that pipeline coming through, she said, slouched over in her chair. I guess it's just another reason to leave this place, I replied. Well, I can understand you wanting to leave, but don't forget that this is our home. This is the place that holds all of our memories of mom. Doesn't it piss you off that within the next year or two, if we do come back to visit, it won't even be the same place? It's like this town is fading with mom. We both sat, a silent, sat in silence, flipping through our photo albums, spending our last night with mom. As fall approached, I knew it was time for two things, Elizabeth's departure and the beginning of my life. I was accepted into Colorado State University, and this was going to be my first, the first semester of my life. Since my aunt lived near the campus, I wasn't going to be completely isolated. This was a huge concern for my sister when we were applying for schools. As for Tommy, he did exactly what he said he was going to do, work in the oil field. The last time Tommy and I spoke, it was on bad terms. I disagreed with his choice because I told him he was worth more. His talent deserved to be shared with everyone else. Of course, Tommy being the hard head he is, Argued that, argued that I have no control over his life, like he didn't mean anything to me, like I didn't deserve to speak my opinion. I was, was I wrong to interfere with his life? He was my friend. I wanted more from him, for all of us. After five years, I finally graduated from Colorado State University with a Bachelor in Fine Arts with a main focus in music theory. Although I had no intention of it, I eventually became a music teacher at a high school in, P in Pueblo, Colorado. Elizabeth still lived in New York City, but she flew down here often, mostly to snap photos of the wonderful mountains and the white snow. Ever since mom died, neither of us has returned to Texas, in all honesty, honesty I don't see the point of ever going back. Hey, I have an idea, Elizabeth said as she was unloading her bags in my guest room. Oh yeah, what's that? Well, since you and I are both off for the summer, why don't we go on a trip? Where to? I don't know. What about strolling through Texas again? What for? You know, it's still the same. Long ass drives, insane truck drivers, and oversized pick pickup trucks hauling livestock. Don't you want to visit mom's grave? Yeah, you're right, I do. I bet mom would be so proud of us, Elizabeth. She always knew that we would have each other to inspire one another. I know that if I didn't have you, I wouldn't have gone to school. I probably wouldn't have ended up with Tommy. In, uh, I probably wouldn't have ended up with Tommy in the oil fields. So thanks, sis. You're welcome, Luke. When we finally arrived in Texas, we stopped at my favorite fast food burger place. This was a necessity upon visiting Texas. 
Well, it was for me. Elizabeth's was taking pictures with the never-ending memory she brought along for the trip. As we pulled into our hometown, I removed Elizabeth's camera from her bag because I was sure she was going to take a picture. She did this every time we entered our hometown. Because of the scenery, Elizabeth and I remained silent upon arriving home. The entire town was different, crowded, uh, dirty, ugly. There were big trucks going, there were trucks going down the highway that the city resides along, day and night, as if they were all in one huge race. The air smelled horrible, even though it had been five years. I could tell. Should I stop? Okay, let me just, what is the end of the sentence? Well, that's probably good. I think you get a sense of, of it. Okay. Nancy Dynan, and I'm going to introduce um, Meg Brandle, um, who is my next door neighbor in offices. Um, Margaret Emma Brandle is a PhD candidate in English with a creative writing concentration. Her writing has been published in Gulf Coast, Hobart, Cartridge Lit, Cheap Pop, and Sundog Lit, among others. She teaches English courses here at Texas Tech and serves as an associate editor for Iron Horse Literary Review. Thank you. So, um, let's see, I've got my timer here. Um, the piece I'm reading today is um, kind of cobbled into a, a single essay, but I have no shortage of material on this subject. Um, it's part of a much longer project. Um, still, this is on keeping notebooks. Gary Paul Nabhan writes in cartoonish print, a capital Q like a lollipop, tiny stroke, giant O at the top. His handwriting is huge. He skips pages. He begins writing a poem in all caps. The poem is in sections, and he switches to sentence case by section four. The rest of the book is blank. I am sitting in a special collections reading room, digging through boxes of other people's notebooks, diaries, and day planners. What sticks out about Nabhan's books is the varying sizes, colors, and materials. There's a handmade red leather notebook, like a traveler's notebook compact, chunky, soft, the leather a texture I've heard other people call buttery and covered in pen marks. In contrast to that, an ugly cream book adorned with butterflies, still bearing the original vellum insert that advertises the manufacturer, ending in the line, remember, there's no right way to journal, just your way. The line is ironic in that I have come here to see if I am doing it right. Barry Lopez has these collections of tiny, flimsy pocket notebooks, some of them still bearing price stickers from the U of O bookstore. The paper is thin and yellow, and his handwriting is beautiful script. The notebooks I page through of his are full of ephemera and movable bits, notes for a book cut up and taped down in search of a structure. Since I was younger, I always loved to read books that mimicked a journal or a diary that were full of doodles and tiny details. I love to note how my colleagues, other writers, other graduate students, take notes in class and in life. A poet I know brings a small, lovely book to class, leather or something like it, and I watch him take careful notes as I scribble random things in a spiral one-subject notebook from Walmart. A fiction writer I observe carries a gutted-out composition book and produces occasionally torn-out pages on which she crosses things out. My greatest accomplishment that no one knows about is that I have kept a notebook since the 1st of January, 2003, recording every day. This is not something I mention in conversation because writers have always kept notebooks and because I am an obsessive person and not always sure my notebooks are something to be proud of. Unlike Sarah Manguso, whose book Ongoingness, The End of a Diary, tells of how she later types all her paper journals into computer documents with a critical editor's eye, I still keep these daily notebooks on paper, and I don't go back to make edits. Also, unlike Manguso, I do not generally in my notebooks seek to capture moments of brilliance or importance or poetic import. I am tied to the mundane. That is, we ate dinner here. After that, I picked this up. After that, I worried about this. After that, I went to bed. It can be cathartic to dump the contents of my head onto the page, but when I fall behind and feel the pressure of the literal years of having done this, pressure to fill in the days I've missed and keep the notebooks going, it weighs on me like a chore, like a responsibility. I always go back and get it down, whatever it is, even if that means I have to relive moments I'd rather forget. 
I feel this immense loyalty to the process, though at the end of the day, I'm not sure why. John Lane has difficult handwriting, but his notebooks contain the occasional illustration. I find a hilarious cartoony doodle of someone in a flipped kayak. The person under the water is still in the kayak, holding a paddle mouth wide open in shock. Two curved arrows indicate the direction the boat needs to roll. The previous page features the same surprised figure, his nose a triangle like a bird, on water that looks like a fluffy cloud. Under the drawing, the label, kayak. Lane's boxes are also full of mostly unused planners, what I call in my notes an absurd surplus of calendars. They're all themed, all illustrated, the New World Cycle of Celebrations calendar, a Norman Rockwell calendar, a thing that labels itself a poetry day book for 1994. A Frank Lloyd Wright calendar houses loose certificates. In 1970, Cleveland Junior High School recognized him for basketball. Ongoingness is not what I expect. I'm thinking that Manguso and I will be kindred spirits, but as it turns out, her diary is more of what I would call a real writer's notebook, a genre different from the notebooks I carry around. My original notebooks were supposed to be for real writing, that is, stories and poems, not daily goings on. But at some point, this kind of daily cataloging became my mode. The documents that more closely resemble my notebooks content-wise are what Molly McCarthy writes about in The Accidental Diarist, day planners, in which, back in the time that the United States was just becoming a country, people diligently measured time by jotting down one or two significant or not so significant details of each day. The weather was a common topic, as was travel. If someone was born or died, that fact was stated, and on to the next day. There is an economy to these day planners, though, that I envy, the fact that the keeping of the diary did not interfere with life. After several years of being extremely picky about the size, shape, and binding of my notebooks, I had become interested in nicer papers, varied sizes, and took with me to Italy a large red faux leather volume with a ribbon bookmark. It was something far more stately than I'd ever used before, which seemed fitting, since I'd also never left the country. For the duration of that nine-day trip, if I had any spare time, it was almost always spent writing. I took breaks to write on the round stones surrounding a Roman fountain, sitting on the steps as we waited in line for Uffizi, between exhausted jet lag naps on the tour bus when we weren't wandering around auto grills, buying Nutella and being refused change because we weren't fast enough for the Italians. My mother has more pictures of me writing in Italy, I think, than she has pictures of me doing anything else. Max Crawford kept day planners, some bought in France, some made in the UK. In those books, he keeps track of every time he calls his mother, does math on blank pages to keep up with expenses, logs the hours he spends working on his writing and sleeping. 1991 is especially full of doodles. Monday, July 22nd features Edison flying a kite with a key on it, a giant cloud with lightning and the word BOOM, all caps. A week in August has water droplets dripping down the page, bigger and bigger the further they go down, tiny ripples at the bottom. A man golfing, his speech bubble calling out the number four with an exclamation mark. I focus on the doodles because his handwriting is so small and difficult to read. At the end of 1997, he makes a list of movie comedies. I haven't seen most of them. My notebooks aren't an accumulation towards a specific project. Once the novelty of one year wore off, I wrote for another and another and another. At 10 years, I felt accomplished, but also in too deep to stop. Even though I didn't feel I had much direction to begin with, much impetus to be doing this once I stopped taking it seriously, once it morphed from writing exercise into catalog. December 31st of this year will mark notebook keeping for 15 years straight, at which point for me as an obsessive person, stopping would be more of an accomplishment than continuing. I discover on one of Gretel Ehrlich's notebooks a dry, rotted rubber band and take it to the front desk of the reading room. They're not supposed to have rubber bands, the man there tells me. The spirals have been removed, so most of these tiny books are held together by binder clips. I flip through all the notebooks labeled Japan Notes, thinking of my own notebooks I purchased in Japan and carried all over, notebooks of varying sizes and colorful designs, decorated sometimes with nonsense English words. The last time I opened one of my notebooks from Japan, I noticed that so many of the receipts I had taped in had almost entirely faded, as if I was trying to keep a bunch of blank paper. This is the double meaning. I have anxiety about keeping my notebooks both ways. 
when I'm not questioning the fact that I write them, that I persist, that I feel it important to remind my future self what I did and experienced and worried about on any day of any given year, I'm questioning how to preserve them, the literal keeping. As I look through other people's notebooks, I remember how the bookshelf in my childhood bedroom is plagued with dust. I recall seeing my brother's boxes and electronics and other belongings shoved up against these bookcases, their papers and t-shirts spilling over into notebook territory. I find myself taking notes about the boxes the library uses for all these documents, though in the end I know better than to look them up. I have researched this previously with serious intent, and if there's one thing I understand about archival boxes, it's that I can't afford them. A woman named Geraldine Jane, in a video online, flips through her moleskin planner, something she decorates weekly and says she uses as a practice art journal. Journal flip-throughs are a whole genre of YouTube, a favorite of mixed media artists, teenage girls, and a substantial population of older women who refer to themselves as crafty girls. Geraldine has a British accent and a pleasantly bright weekly planner. She has painted pinks, oranges, and neon greens. She has tipped in other pieces of paper she embellished with a typewriter. She has multiple colored tassels and ribbons hanging off the book. It is mesmerizing to watch her turn the pages to see what color combinations and collaged items will appear next. But most interesting of all is when she turns to a blank week. This is a week, it started out well for me, but then I ran into a bit of a hard time, she narrates. I was just stuck and I decided to leave it. I now remember exactly what happened that week. She says, the blank page can sometimes speak, even as powerfully as a page you've created on. The closest I come to having blank pages in my notebook is an absence of content that only I know is missing. I was a senior in undergrad at the University of Alabama when the tornado hit the week before finals. My notebook from the time, a small, unlined book in which I wrote with multicolored gel pens, doesn't describe how I was feeling. It doesn't go into how I selfishly felt robbed of a ritual of lasts now that finals were canceled and May graduation was moved to August. On those tornado days, I didn't record how my then boyfriend refused to spend time alone with me, how we all stood on the precarious dock of a friend's lake house across the bridge in Northport away from Tuscaloosa, as he swam far, far out into the cold, deep lake without me, twilight falling all around us so we could barely see well enough to climb back up the steep hill. It doesn't capture the night my friends crowded onto beds and air mattresses all in one tiny front bedroom, and I gave them the reading I had wanted to give them, the night before my dad drove in and moved me out of my dorm room, determined to spirit me out of Tuscaloosa and away from the wreckage as fast as possible. I shielded myself from the disappointment and guilt of never being allowed to do cleanup work since it didn't open to volunteers until after I left, just like I shielded myself from the fact that my boyfriend no longer wanted to be with me, the fact that I realized the friends I spent those days with would all go on with undergrad as I went off to grad school and eventually forget to miss me, and the fact that if the tornado had taken a path just a few blocks north of where it plowed through, we wouldn't have had dorm rooms to return to or move out of we may not even have had each other. Sarah Manguso writes about how mem memories gradually become corrupt, not to be trusted. Quote, sensory memory lasts about 200 to 500 milliseconds after perception, then it starts to degrade. Working memory or short-term or short memory allows recall for a period of several seconds to a minute. End quote. It goes on, seems that every time we call up a memory, we risk losing pieces of it. The writer's notebooks are full of diagrams and doodles and sensory details, the smallest details, the ones we find most beautiful and useful. My notebooks may be less purposeful, but are still full of sentences that hold weight when I reread them in the future. Observations about people I loved or would love, the last times I saw or spoke to someone unknowing. A time capsule, but in reverse, full of the things that surrounded the real stories of my life, the parts I didn't know yet were stories. Okay, and now I get to introduce Nancy. So, uh, Nancy Wason Dinan earned an MFA from The Ohio State University in the spring of 2013 and is a PhD student in fiction at Texas Tech University, where she serves as a managing editor for Iron Horse Literary Review. Recent work has appeared or is forthcoming in the Texas Observer, Crab Orchard Review, the Cincinnati Review, and Arts and Letters. 
And I have a, um, a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, it's already there. Okay. Um, so I'm actually going to read creative work, but I'm going to spend a few minutes situating it in a critical context. Um, I'm going to read from my work in progress. Um, but this is the, the critical context is something I've been thinking about for some time, and it's it's um, a very sort of unscientific observation of trends I'm seeing. Um, but it, I'm calling it writing post post apocalypse. Um, our, our apocalyptic moment has, has lasted for a long time, um, but we still want to write these things. So, um, and we're, we're it's, I'm calling it situating creative work in a time of sustained crisis. So. so our current post-apocalyptic moment in literature has extended back um, to the early 2000s. Um, uh, there's been a lot of post-apocalyptic literature that existed before that, but we see this boom then. Um, we see that The Road, when the bullets are in 2007, it comes out in 2006. Orcs and Craig is in 2003. Um, the Stand is a little bit before that. Um, and I'll show you a graph shortly of, how, of where, um, of, of the concentration of post-apocalyptic literature um, compared to the year. Um, Post-apocalyptic writing is often a response to a current crisis, which I, we've been living in these crises for a while. Um, crisis is sort of becoming default. Um, now, however, we find ourselves facing environmental and humanitarian crises, um, and it seems like at an accelerated rate. Um, books like The Sixth, Sixth Great Extinction, um, and we see, part of this, I think, is the, the way we consume media. Um, and how we constantly are exposed to these things, but I think that also we see that, that we're destroying our environment um, and that we're allowing things to happen in the world that are humanitarian crises. Um, but post-apocalyptic fiction is really hard to place, I think, at this point. Um, I remember having a conversation at the Swanee Writers Conference about how um, a debut writer would have a really hard time placing a post-apocalyptic novel. We've seen them. Um, and so how do we uh, make, we want to write this stuff, how do we make it fresh? Um, so I say we're not ready to be finished with post-apocalyptic stories, um, and I see this based on what I'm observing, but what I think I really mean is that um, I don't think we're, ready, we're finished writing post-apocalyptic stories. I think we might be sort of finished reading them to a certain extent. Um, but the moment seems to be evolving, because the usual stories about pandemics or catastrophic war or environmental disasters, no matter how intriguing those are, aren't quite as fresh as they used to be. And I pulled this, and I'm sorry, it's a small, from a website that tracks science fiction sales, and the x-axis is the year the book came out, and the y-axis is actually um, something called a pop score. It's the number of Amazon reviews times the stars that the reviewers give it, so it's sort of a way to track the book in pop culture. Um, so, I mean, obviously you can see that Amazon wasn't around in the 50s, um, but, but people were still reviewing these books, right? So you can see this big bump right around 1960, another in 1980, and then in the 2000s, this giant bump in post apocalyptic literature. So, um, and all of my cover, uh, my graphics are covers of post-apocalyptic novels that have come out recently. So where literature seems to be headed next, in my very um, sort of unscientific observation of things I've seen in workshops, in my capacity as editor, um, and in uh, literature that, that comes up, that I've seen coming out. Um, one is fiction that seems to handle time in a different way, and I don't want to imply that this is new, but I want to say that I'm seeing a lot more of it. Um, I'm seeing things like temporal loops, um, stories that end where they begin. So there's this, this sense of stasis of um, being trapped in something. Um, similar to this, uh, but not quite, is, is the idea of indigenous time, where Western time, we think we can get like chronological, starting here, proceeding, proceeding forward, right? Um, but indigenous time is sort of cyclical. Um, and I'm seeing more stories where we get the impression that the thing has happened before and that it will happen again, that, we're, that, um, that the time is cyclical. Um, I'm also seeing, um, and this is sort of unusual, stories told um, in the iterative or in perfect tense. Um, and what I mean by this is uh, the difference between on Monday I went to work is a past 
tent, right? Um, but on Mondays, I went to work, it, that would be the imperfect tense, right? We know this from our second language learning. We know this from studying French or Spanish. But um, stories that are written like this um, have this really slippery sense of time. You know, it's really hard to grasp the narrative present in a story um, that's written in the imperfect tense. I also um, seem to see, so instead of moving past the, the post-apocalyptic time in the narrative moment, I'm seeing a lot of stories that are told in the moment before the apocalypse, like you're trapped in that time. It seems like a teleological, inevitable moment that uses dramatic irony as momentum. You know that the world is about to end and you can't really do anything about it. Um, and finally, I, um, I'm seeing a couple of other things, but I've seen fiction steeped in this sort of elegy and nostalgia. Um, and it's, it's, fiction is using this sort of cataloging effect um, to, to record the world as it is now. Um, and it's this last category that I'd like to spend some time on, and then I'll read from my creative work a little bit. Um, I'm calling this sort of unti unscientifically taxonomic fiction. And so my first cover here would be like a true taxonomy book, um, Amphibians and Reptiles of Texas, although that would be a fantastic title, I think, for a novel. Um, it, this is actually not a novel, right? This is a book that allows you to identify amphibians and reptiles of Texas uh, based on certain, they're categorized in the book and you're able to trace them. Um, and an example of this is a book um, that was read from last night with the Iron Horse Missing Writer series. Um, Anne Valenti wrote a book called Our Hearts Will Burn Us Down, and in this book, she has these sort of primary source artifacts that she's created, um, wiring di diagrams, house plans, obituaries, um, and all of this is concerned with classification and recording of the world, if the protagonist knows it, um, with the sense that, that the, the world's being recorded because it's disappearing. Like, this is an important thing to do, there's a timeline to record it, because we don't have long. So here, I'm gonna take a look at the taxonomic impulse in my current work in progress. This is a novel I'm calling Things You Would Know If You Grew Up Around Here. Um, and it's set in the Texas Hill Country outside of Austin, outside of a town called Marble Falls on Lake Marble Falls. And um, I didn't actually set a timer, so, but I know I'm running short, so I'm only gonna read a little bit. Um, so, in our, so the book is structured with uh, these sort of expository sections that are titled, titled Things You Would Know If You Grew Up Around Here. And in between each of these sections is the narrative. Um, there's not a ton of a narrative in the exposition, expositional sections, but there it is a first person narrator, so you do have the sense of consciousness um, that's, and uh, somebody experiencing the world. So the, very, the book begins with, um, also this book is set in, right before the Memorial Day floods of 2015. Um, which affected um, all of Texas, I believe. Um, so the book begins with this, this short section, this drought is the worst anybody has ever seen. And I'm gonna read from this right now. <clears throat> Even the oldest of the old timers agree, it's been over two years since the lakes were full and now they're at less than 30%. Cattle are dying, so beef prices are skyrocketing. The towns at the bottoms of the lakes are rising up out of them. The old timers say it's not the apocalypse, but the leading edge of it. They say that we're giving too much water to the rice farmers 100 miles south. This area of the world was never meant to grow rice. The restaurants on the lake closed a long time ago. The boat ramps jut out into thin air. They say an El Nino will fill everything back up as if the warming of the earth is a good thing. But rain or no, we will be a desert one day. That is the direction this part of the earth is taking. Once we were at the bottom of an ocean, the dinosaur bones you find here are finned. The limestone, the remnants of an ancient seabed. The coming storm will bring water, but it's temporary. The tide is on its way out. So you can start to get a sense of narrative there, although there's not, you don't get characters, you don't get action. You get this exposition of what the world is like. Um, and I don't think I have time to, to read more, but I did want to point out um, that some of these categories are different. Um, where there's quartz, there's gold is a very scientific category of um, what you're looking for if you're looking for gold. So people pan for gold in the Texas Hill Country and what, how do you know you're in a good spot? Um, and then 
this one, there's more gold in the ground in Sinatabic County than there is in circulation in the world. This is more lore, like things you know if you grew up around here, but there's no, there's no way we can prove this, right? But in, in Sinatabic County, there's supposed to be several treasures in the ground. Um, the Emperor Maximilian fleeing um, Mexico, um, and this was the treasure that Jim Bowie actually came to Texas for. Um, there's supposed to be, um, there are these tales of people coming out of the hills paying for things with like a gold ingot and um, then disappearing and never being seen again. So, um, in fact, on my family's um, um, land outside of Lake Marble Falls, there's supposed to be an abandoned silver mine. And it's only a couple of acres. You would think that we could find this, but, um, <laughs> but no, no. So, um, so we have all of these, there are probably 40 of these in the novel to give this, this sort of background. And some of them are things that you definitely would know if you were from there. Um, purple blazes, do you guys know what purple blazes on a fence? I feel like if you grew up outside of Austin, you know this, but nobody else does. It means no trespassing. If you see purple blazes on a fence, I would not cross that. <laughs> um, because, it, because who knows what would do on the other side, right? So, um, so what these sections do is they provide exposition in a different way. I'm not giving this in dialogue, which would slow the momentum down. Um, they catalog the world of the Texas Hill Country in a way that I consider to be t taxonomic, recording this and categorizing it. And they capture a moment in time that will not exist for very much longer. Um, we know that the world will change in my children's lifetime. We know that the world, that the way we live um, now is not sustainable, right? So in short, I consider these sections to be taxonomic and pre-apocalyptic. And I'm seeing these, um, these sorts of trends um, in other places too. Yeah, that's, that's actually something that I've been looking into a lot lately that I find really fascinating. Um, especially, like, I mean, there are some, th there's, you know, a rash of writers who are like, oh, we'll burn all my papers when I die. And everyone's like, nope, I'm going to go send this off into the world. Um, and it's it's really a strange space. Like, I was reading, um, there's a, a notebook of Flannery O'Connor's that's been published called A Prayer Journal. And it's just... Um, it's, it's like, it was kind of in the form of like letters where she's addressing God and then she gives up halfway through and is like, oh, I'm not, I'm not good enough for this. This is all, this isn't sincere or something like that. Uh, but it's funny because it does have that same kind of quality of, I think, those comments on Didion's like, oh, it was really nice, but she, she just kind of didn't say anything new. Um, I forgot what your question was. Well, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. It's it's really. I there's like a there's a woman from my hometown who published a collection of her um, pieces from her childhood diaries, um, and it's it's published as nonfiction. It's called Miss American Pie, uh, but it does kind of have an arc of like her learning things about her friends and and growing up in a certain era, um, and I feel like. You know, that kind of document is like super highly edited. Like, and I even wonder, you know, names are changed. Like, how much of this was adding in extra material um, versus like, 
uh, I don't know, like people who have written things with the intention of them being published eventually, like the diary of Anne Frank, like, you know, how Anne Frank wrote the diary of Anne Frank and um, kept circling back to make edits to her own work. Um, I, I don't really have an answer for that, but it's something, I, I'm actually teaching a class about it in the fall, so <laughs> I'll be exploring that some more soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. This question is for Nancy. Have you considered it, or are you exploring also the issue of time in the realm of post-traumatic stress? Since this is, I mean, I had not considered that, but and, and you say this, and I think, why haven't I considered that? Um, I think that's a really good point, and I'd like to, because I, I, I don't have personal experience with post-traumatic stress disorder, but I, but I have heard people describe it, so I think that's a really good point, Bernadette. Um, and I'd like to explore it. Thank you. Well, I was just going to say, um, either for your, for your uh, essay on the notebooks or, uh, and, and or for your class uh, just about a year ago, with, uh, a book of Emily Dickinson's Envelope. Thank you. Um, he he was a a uh, McNair finalist, which means that he was an award winner, and so he had to do a reading before in front of uh, the Saul Ross community. And, and I think he did what I wanted, what I just did, which is read the conclusion. Um, but I, I asked him to hi highlight the, the main ideas of Lopez. And he, then he, what he did was he pulled out all these segments and I thought it was crazy, I can't do that. And it's not gonna be coherent. And so there's a, uh, so I, my goal was to just read the conclusion, which is, um, it's, a, uh, it's very emotional. And his, uh, the main character, Luke's old friend, comes back uh, f uh, to town. They meet at his mother's uh, graveside, and then they, they uh, uh, reach a reconciliation. Um, so, uh, but one of the interesting things that uh, Joey said he found about uh, Barry Lopez's stories was that they're often open-ended, and there's no easy conclusion at the end. Um, at what is Canadian, but um, that would be my only exception to the American. And then, you know, it, um, we get 
we don't get a ton of international submissions um, at the journal. Um, and then the workshops I participated in would be um, primarily Amer American. Um, although at Suwanee there are a few um, uh, other countries represented. So that that is actually um, a really good question. And I think also somewhat reassuring that this idea of the apocalypse has been around for a while. Um, that we are not, I mean, that, that this might be something sort of pathological that we're considering within us instead of um, some sort of like moment where we're about to go over the precipice too. Although it does feel like that. I'm not just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and really productive for fiction, right? Th that we want to explore this. So, um, so, so yeah, we push on those fears a little bit. So. of um, it being a sort of a cultural effect, um, which makes you me sort of want to trace it back to the cause, right? And um, with is, with indigenous time, you can I, there is a cause that we can trace it back to, um, but it, 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 it certainly brings up a big question, right? What, why are we as a culture responding to this in such a in such a way? So that is so fascinating to me too, and I've wondered about who the control group is, right? Who doesn't have trauma in their ancestors' <laughs> DNA, right? So how do we even compare this? Well, part of that is resilience, the ability to come back from trauma, and the issue of whether there's consistent one after another trauma since. So we oh. have these very variables in that place. Just having the moment to recover yeah. um, does. It, and to heal, maybe, to some extent. Yeah, I, I love that idea of it being sort of cultural. I, for this project, um, uh, I, I, the characters in this project, I don't know. I, 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 I can't say whether or not they would be suffering from like a PTSD effect, but I do think that they feel like they bear some responsibility for what has happened in the world, um, so, um, or what is happening in the world. Um, so, yeah, that's something to consider. Because if we have some, if, if we have, if we can trace back trauma, right, then we, we can also, we also have somebody who inflicted the trauma, right? So there, there's another side to this. Yeah. 